Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is John McKenzie. John, also known as the Flying Farmer, is a helicopter pilot, farmer and green energy advocate. An ex-Army Air Corps helicopter pilot, you've flown on military and commercial operations worldwide for over 20 years and have more than 8,000 hours flying experience. Your flying has also included aerial filming of events such as the Great Northern Run, the Great Scottish Swim, the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, as well as television programmes including Monarch of the Glen, Monty Hall's Great Escape, Bear Grylls, Born Survivor and Three Men in a Boat. And in 2015, you were Nicola Sturgeon's pilot during her general election campaign. Most recently, you've founded Glen Wivis Distillery, built on history powered by nature. In the biggest ever community crowdfunding campaign in UK history, Glen Wivis is the world's first 100% community owned distillery, entirely powered by renewable energy, which will produce high quality craft Scottish whiskey and craft gin. John, it's brilliant to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elliot. Great to be here. Wonderful <laughs> setting. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's quite an impressive resume you have. Um, it will be really interesting to find out how you kind of, you know, meandered throughout <laughs> your, your life to, to end up where you are. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, going back to, I suppose, your, your roots, if you like, I mean, what was your early life like? I think the word I would use is normal um, and maybe also stable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, it, you know, I just turned 43. Um, I think I count myself very lucky now um, at this uh, the ripe old age to have such a stable upbringing uh, and maybe thank my lucky stars for that um, parents been happily married for a long time and uh, you know i have a br older brother younger sister mm -hmm. everyone's really healthy and well and lived in the highlands born and bred in this small town of uh, dingwall just near inverness mm -hmm. most people have heard of inverness not so many dingwall <laughs> yeah. but we're trying to change that and yeah very happy um you know uh, active um, y young man um, from from that early early start that I was given. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It, this is actually one of my later questions, but it seems prudent to ask you now. I mean, how would you describe Dingwall and the Scottish Highlands to someone who had never seen it? It's it's a market town. Um, if you think about um, surrounded by fields of barley, open grassland with cows and sheep still very active in both, uh, you know, in, in all those areas from not just all barley, there's still beef producers and, and uh, you know, lambing, etc. It all ties in very well to the local environment. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has a good school, um, a big school, one of the biggest uh, in the Highlands, a secondary school and also a primary school. Gone are the days of these small schools that were outside. They've all kind of become centralised. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's a vibrant town, just over 5,000 people. It's got um, one, two, three supermarkets <laughs> um, and a few small <laughs> express shops. So yeah, it's a, it's a busy little place, but it was lacking one particular thing, and that was tourism. And it's something that I felt we could, we could change and bring into Dingwall was tourism because it's uh, at the foot of Ben Wivis, which is a, a Monroe, a mountain, just on the edge of Dingwall. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, I thought time that people came into Dingwall and it would give it a, a boost. Yeah. The, the high street suffering from online purchasing, just really? like many, many rural locations. It's so yeah. easy just to, to buy online. Um, you've got your iPad there, you could order yeah. anything. You could be ordering something now. <laughs> um, and you know, it'll drive at your door, yeah. with it, but it does have an effect on um, you know, jobs and uh, in the local area. So yeah, I wanted to bring tourism where people are enjoying what's there that, uh, right at that point, uh, which is the weather, the surroundings, what they're eating, what they're drinking and where it's come from and the people around them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good stuff. You were schooled in Dingwall. Yes, um, absolutely. What, what did you do once you left school? What, what was your sort of career path? Well, I, I wanted to be a pilot from a young age. Right. Um, we did what was called work experience from age 14, 15, and I did my first one with a vet. Um, I, I, wor I wanted to work with animals. Um, so I did the first one, I think, age 14 with a vet, and then the second one, age 15, I did with a helicopter company. That's when I got the bag and thought, wow, these guys have got big watches. I want to fly these fancy, um, noisy machines. The smell of uh, av gas, being able to take off and land in such a small space, and I thought that's what I want to do. So I actually went 
I won a scholarship from the Navy um, initially at age okay. 17 and I had a pilot's license for flying aeroplanes when I was 18. Wow. So I really was straight into the training to be a pilot uh, age 18 um, from school, finished school. Um, I did do, I studied in Aberdeen for one year, um, fitness leisure management. Um, but I was on a scholarship from, from the Navy and did my pilot's license, but then decided that I wanted to do that right now. I didn't want to wait, do a degree. It was, flying was in me and that's what I wanted to do. So um, I found out that the Army had more helicopters than the Navy and the Air Force put together. Um, didn't know that. And just um, uh, the recruiting officer for the Army Air Corps had not long left the Army and was, had bought a farm, ironically, just on the edge of Dingwall. My father ran the auction mart and uh, he, they got talking one day and he mentioned that I wanted to be a helicopter pilot and uh, the chap Robbie mentioned uh, you know, that he could maybe assist. So just like we are here today, a door opened and I met with him and he guided me through what, um, you know, all the hurdles and you know, lo and behold, a year later I was uh, at Sandhurst um, marching round um, and asking myself where the helicopter was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but that's part of the process to, to, um, to getting to, to become a pilot uh, in the Army Air Corps. Amazing. So yeah, yeah it was uh, really straight from school <laughs> and not long after I was um, in, in the military getting yeah. ready to be a, a pilot, albeit I already had a, 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 a license uh, for flying other things. Yeah, yeah, time. right, and at so the deep end. Yeah. So, yeah. so what were some of the experiences that you had doing that then? Well, I think um, you have to be quite disciplined at an early age. Maybe, you know, you can imagine 17-year-olds um, tend to be, um, you know, doing lots of, you know, 17-year-old things. And yeah. to, be, to train to be a pilot, you really have to become quite mature early on and think about where it is you want to be to compete with, you know, your contemporaries who are maybe generally a bit older um, and have set very sensible heads on their shoulders. It's a serious business, it's safety, um, uh, it's passengers trusting you to get them from, from A to B. Yeah. So yeah, and then you throw the military aspect in as well. So that's fitness, that's discipline again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but it's still enjoying life um, and, uh, and starting to understand that um, the travel that goes with being a pilot and the military aspect again of um, learning about why <laughs> why we've had a uh, presence in various countries, <laughs> you know, through the the war aspect of uh, you know of hundreds of years and just really putting all that together and starting to mould me in terms of where um, where my life was was going to go, coming from a normal but like I say stable background um, as the son of an auctioneer um, in the Highlands uh, mm -hmm. at Dingwall. <laughs> And so how long did you do that? I was in the army for nine years. Okay. Um, and within that time frame, I was very fortunate. I won an exchange uh, to the Canadian Air Force. So I flew um, for the Canadian Air Force for three years. I always say I was very fortunate that I went to Canada to fly in such an amazing country for three years. But mm. of course, one of their pilots had to come here to fly <laughs> for, for that length <laughs> right. of time. And uh, ex it's more, he always said it was more expensive living here than it was for me living in uh, in Canada. So, uh, yeah. but amazing experience, and I, I travelled to every province uh, in Canada and met some amazing people and uh, great aviators. Um, huge amounts of uh, aviation there. It's, uh, such a remote country, and yeah, um, some people will never leave Canada, but they'll be h hugely travelled because there's um, there's so much to see and uh, so many places to visit. So yeah, it was a fantastic experience. So that was my mid twenties mm -hmm. um, before I returned back to um, uh, the next posting, which was down in the south of England, where a lot of um, the, our military presence is, um, and the bases around London and um, down south. So yeah, it was um, a, great, a great nine years. Um, I suppose I left at the right time because I missed it and still you know, really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But um, once you make a decision, uh, you know, I'm a believer that you, um, you don't look back and you will find new experiences and, um, and go forward with that. So moving from military flying to commercial flying. I had the grounding of the physical flying of helicopters, but yeah. the commercial aspect when it involves people paying um, for something, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a, different, uh, uh, a different mindset really. Um, yeah. No defense budget, it's, a, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's someone's hard earned um, 
shilling that's possibly paying for you to do a job and they want it done mm -hmm. right they want it done well um and uh, that you know it's it's good to remember that I yeah to say. yeah 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 i was that was that was actually going to be my question i suppose is how did you transition from military to to commercial um, and what were the, yeah, I suppose maybe some of the major differences between the two? Um yeah, I think the, the big, I mean, transitioning, it's um, the sky is still the sky. So you're still flying in the, you know, the same, yeah. uh, the same uh, <laughs> big blue area up there. But yeah, you, you just, it's, there's different rules, different regulations, um, but it's not hugely different in that way. It's still a uniform um, to a certain um extent no one's trying to shoot you down or um, <laughs> fight against you yeah. so but like i say there's there's usually when there's uh, any sort of um, monetary um, influence going on then that's a different um, that's a different war to fight so to make sure that you're doing the job right and doing it well so that everyone's getting paid and and is and is happy and i always say if i don't hear afterwards it's all gone to plan. Everyone's happy. Uh, that, that's all you can ask. So mm -hmm. not, not a hugely difficult transition, mm -hmm. um, and but very interesting. And you yeah. know, I've enjoyed the commercial aspect just as much as the military. Um, I still look back with fond memories on, on the time, uh, and it gave me a great grounding in travel and friendships. Um, you know, to at such a young age. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, who, who are some of the interesting people that you've had in your in your helicopter? Oh, well, <laughs> there's interesting, there's infamous. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I've been quite fortunate in the different roles that I've, um, I've worked in, from flying an air ambulance to film, TV, VIPs. Um, I've worked on a, a, a number of G8 summits. So, yeah, from world leaders to sports personalities, um, and uh, yeah, other reasons people become famous. I don't know. I mean, I can I can <laughs> rattle off some names. Um, yeah, go ahead. Very famous, I'm very famous footballer um, who's married to one of the posh uh, the posher Spice Girls. <laughs> you can work out who that is. <laughs> Quite a good-looking chap. Uh, yeah, David Beckham. Very uh, you know great to fly him there. I think that was two years ago. He was in Scotland, <laughs> doing a, a TV advert. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a real adventurer, Bear Grylls, done a few shows with him, great fun, um, watching him do his backflip out of the helicopter. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, flying him on a few shows, yeah, really interesting chap again. And, uh, yeah, you know, people, uh, the royal family, um, I think very proud to, to be at that level, to take people um, from A to B and to get them there safely. Um, I suppose I should mention, um, it's always interesting to mention that the current president of the United <laughs> States, um, I have, Mr. I, I, Trump. yeah, I have flown him um, before he was president, of course, <laughs> right, yeah. um, and when, when he was buying his estate in Scotland. Um, again, very interesting character, very charming. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that was obviously over 10 years ago when he initially came to, came to Scotland. Um, sports personalities from um, Sebastian Coe to... Um, Pippa Middleton um, to a sports event, hmm. um, yeah, lots of uh, you know just uh, Ridley Scott, you know, movies, amazing, um, yeah, lots of dozens, so hundreds. <laughs> so, how do you manage the sort of pressure of having somebody like that, and you're essentially, you know, you're in charge of their life at that stage? Yeah, I think I always say um, if you're not nervous about something, you're maybe not giving it a hundred percent. So yeah, I think uh, you know I've, I'm always um, a little bit nervous when you go. Oh, I've got the first minister, and um, mm -hmm. that's really important. Not just because it's important for their safety, but also I, I want things to go well because they'll be doing an important task, and I want it to them to achieve what they're trying to achieve. If you're, yeah. we, you know, I flew um, the first minister Alex Salmond for um, the referendum, and you know that's an important time for him, for the country, and I, you know, they've given me this great responsibility to get them safely from A to B, and to, so that they can do their job. The same with um, the current First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, for um, the general election, and also the, the last year's Scottish elections. Again, to get them through the weather, to get them safely, and indeed, um, the Nicola Sturgeon had never been in a helicopter before, and I picked her up at Prestonfield House. Um, and mm. of course, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of cameras, a lot of people filming and you know it's my responsibility it's not just about flying a helicopter it's about managing what's going on around it at the same time so yeah there's um and a little bit of preparation and just consideration for 
for the, the, what they're trying to do in their job alongside. So it can be, yeah, it can be, there can be some pressure mm -hmm. uh, to make sure, but uh, yeah, a bit of preparation and consideration for, uh, for what they're trying to achieve. And, and sm a smile goes a long way, I always say. Yeah. Um, it reassures everyone that, uh, you know, you know, you know what you're doing, even if you're, <laughs> even if you're apprehensive <laughs> or, yeah. ner or nervous yourself, which is perfectly normal. Yeah. Perfectly normal. <laughs> Good stuff. Your farming, um, you know, it's interesting because you're obviously very passionate about green energy and the idea of kind of a helicopter pilot who's interested in green energy seems kind of oxymoronic in many ways. So w why did you decide to get involved in, in farming and when did the your sort of green energy come into uh, focus? So to go, to go back to um, I wanted to be a vet, um, I've always liked working with animals son of a livestock auctioneer. Um, my early years were spent, um, I don't say working so much, I say grafting, um, <laughs> chasing sheep, cows, up at five o'clock in the morning before school, chasing them down the high street as there was big sales in the, uh, you know, in the town. So physical work, uh, tiring work, and that gave me a good grounding. Um, and, but I enjoyed it, I enjoyed working um, with animals. Not becoming a vet, not um, you know, not ever going down that route. But I still had that in me that I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I bought my farm in two thousand and seven, um, and at that point, I've been flying for um, a long time, maybe uh, fifteen, more than fifteen years. I'd seen a lot um, that had formed, um, you know, lots of opinions. Th this this whole helicopter thing, what I get to see in any week or month. A majority of people may not see in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. From going to, these, um, to an amazing ho home or island or location um, that has stood there for hundreds and hundreds of years that may have, have a hydro scheme, the island of rum, um, egg with its, um, its uh, you know, electricity, energy, system mm -hmm. and it, it, it just I, I always have a look and try and find out what's um, at the root of why I'm there um, it's not as simple as just flying somewhere from A to B there's usually a reason and the personalities they may not be famous but they may have hugely interesting um, tales to tell um, and I always ask and um, find out and it's it's just given me a great um, grounding as to how everything works from Georgian and Victorian times to you know how people existed and history I'm fascinated by history and travel mm -hmm. um, particularly in Scotland but obviously further afield um, and that's how I, I, I really believe that renewable energy is something that was always there and harnessing the weather which is one of the few things uh, the mountains are still there the weather is still there as it was in all those time frames and people harness them and uh, make choices at, uh, at different times. And maybe now we're making the right choices um, by developing the cleaner and more environmentally friendly energy sources because we still need energy and everybody wants to, to yeah. have energy um, that, that doesn't maybe damage the environment as, as much as fossil fuels. So it, it's, it is a bit of a strange one that helicopters gives me that interest mm -hmm. uh, or has given me that insight but that's where it's come from is that's what's led me and they are of course um, um, far from carbon neutral there are you may uh, you may be aware unmanned aerial vehicles are plenty now uh, UAVs and we've even there's been trials with unmanned helicopters and that's coming more and more so maybe I won't be flying helicopters forever they mm -hmm. will be flying themselves so yeah, it's, um, there's always progress. There's nothing surer than there is always change um, in life. Um, so yeah, it's about um, understanding the environment around us and uh, making, making those choices. I offset, so I've invested in a dozen um, green energy projects throughout Scotland, which allows me to offset the flying that I still do. I have reduced the flying um, a lot over the last uh, five years. And yeah, the the farming aspect, I always wanted to do that, and it, it's mm -hmm. a business which runs alongside the flying. Helicopters and farming are both 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. um, there's always um, a need for, um, for helicopters to go to an island, particularly in Scotland, or to do something up a mountain, 
Um, there's always a storm or there's always someone visiting, there's always something happening. They're just amazingly versatile machines um, and mm. animals of course need uh, need attention and fed um, every day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's a, it really it just dovetails perfectly together, the mm. flying and the farming. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's both my passion, so I'm very, I, I sit here very content and happy that it, it puts a smile on my face every day um, with what, what I get to, to see each week. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I've read into, um, you know, the extent that you, you do this. I mean, it says the systems at the farm include wind, hydro, on and off grid, solar PV, solar gain, solar thermal, biomass and an ele electric car. Um, and I know that you've uh, I've read that you spent quite a significant amount in putting a lot of this in um, and offsetting it. I mean, it says that you've I think you've generated over a million kilowatts. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's not hu in, in energy terms. Um, you know, that that's sounds like a lot. It <laughs> is for an individual. Yeah, it it is. I'm not an energy company. Uh, you know, far <laughs> from it. So yeah, I I think I've done I've done my bit, and we continue to do more. Um, yeah, it's. I think it's uh, in some ways it's good that I'm helicopter pilot because it gives a little bit of a. Um, he's not a geek that's doing, you know, <laughs> it's not some lollipop stick. It's, this is proper energy production yeah. at a modern level. Um, it all works. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the helicopter aspect in the, in the less positive way is that it's a, a jet engine and it's, uh, you know, it's not carbon neutral, but to offset it um, is, is my way of, um, of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and investing in other projects. But uh, the simple fact is that the use of helicopters for the things that they do, that is something which is needed, um, from air ambulance to getting things up a mountain. Um, you know, and, but that will change. I think in my lifetime, we will see things happening in an unmanned way. It's moving at a, an unbelievable pace, um, the, the unmanned aspect from cars to buses to to aircraft, it's coming. I find that terrifying. Yeah, terrifying. Me you too. know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe well. I'll have to change. I'll have to change the business name <laughs> uh, just to the farmer. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think. I think maybe an electric helicopter would be okay. An unmanned one's just another uh, another yeah, level. They exist. It's, Is that right? Yeah, there's been try. Yeah, I've witnessed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. indeed. Well, yes, it could indeed. be in your on your future. Yes. <laughs> So your latest, um, I, I don't know if I'd call it a project, it's far bigger than that, is Glenwivis Distillery. Um, you're the founder and the managing director of that. So, I mean, how is this whole thing, it's, it seems to have snowballed in a great way, in a kind of alarming way as well. How did it all come about? Well, the, the Glenwivis project was conceived when I was doing the day job of flying um, some VIPs, um, I suppose you'd call them if they're... Um, corporation level executives um, visiting distilleries that they owned. Um, you know, I was fully aware that there was a lot of distilleries in Scotland and I suppose when they're sat with you, you start to question, this must be a very successful business if they're hiring helicopters to go mm. around distilleries. Um, mm. And the, it just was on the right day, I happened to have a tour guide with me um, who was um, flying we were flying to a distillery on the west coast and it was actually some, some Russian um, high-end tourists. And we got talking about where I was from when they were having their tour of a distillery um, with, the, with the tour guide. And uh, I had already started to uncover some of the history that existed around the Dingwall area, this huge history mm -hmm. of whiskey distilling um, in the Dingwall area. And I was thinking about how I could potentially have a community-owned distillery at that point. We had just raised a million pounds for a, the first cooperatively owned wind turbine in Scotland. So I had just understood how the cooperative process worked in terms of raising money and kind of crowdfunding, but in a community-led way. So it was timing is everything. It was the right time. And just these series of catalysts of meeting um, this renowned tour guide of flying corporation level executives and going, this must be a viable business, mm. um, liquid gold. Um, <laughs> and yeah, having the, the drive and uncovering the, the history that existed and then scratching my head and going, I think we could do this, this and this. And, and then taking the risk and uh, yeah. But I was one person that had the idea that put it all together, 
-hmm. But of course, um, it took initially seven directors to, to come on board with me um, and take the risk of reputation to, to mm -hmm. try to raise what was a huge amount of money to try to raise. Mm -hmm. um, and then for these three and a half thousand people to back it, mm -hmm. um, which is just amazing. And that's where we are, where we are today. And it's a, you know, it's a project which will um, only go from strength to strength. We haven't scratched the surface of its success yet um, as a social enterprise. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's bringing it to fruition now is amazing, but I think its legacy um, in 10, 20 years' time, just like its product, it's a, it really is such a great story um, mm -hmm. that there will be this product in years to come, but the legacy will also be the financial um, grants that will be given out for other good projects. It's just a different way, it's a different way of doing it, and it's our national drink. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a really, <laughs> I don't know, it's a really cool project, and I love yeah. working on it. My position running the business is, is, um, is voluntary. Um, as a new business, it, it's always difficult to, to cover costs, and I didn't want to benefit from it. Uh, as a social enterprise, I want to lead from the front, and maybe that's part of the that's part of the success that um, that people know that I've put my um, my reputation and my um, thinking in the, you know put I don't want to say my money where my mouth is but I've put my mm -hmm. um, what I believe to be right at the forefront of the project and I think it comes back from my military training and leadership and that you, you know you have to you know you've got to lead a little bit and uh, hopefully um, people will then you know understand and um, and come on board, which is which is amazing. That's yeah. What's happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking at some of the um, the kind of facts and figures. I mean, two thousand and and this could be actually kind of historic now. Two thousand six hundred investors, sixty percent local IV, which presumably is Inverness postcode, yeah. and the remainder from thirty one countries worldwide. In um, as we said, the biggest ever community crowdfunding campaign. I mean, why do you think it's had this sort of incredible reception that it has? Well, community, I think the community that is Scotch malt whiskey enthusiasts, so people, um, they, they really, whiskey is, it's a huge um, product. Scotch malt can only be made in this country under mm. very stringent rules. Um, the Whiskey Association have managed it amazingly well, and wherever you go in the world, you will find our product there, Scotch malt. So I, that was a one community that I knew existed, um, mm -hmm. And it's a huge crowd. And to make this a success, we needed lots of people, not one bank manager, but thousands. So that's one part of it. But then the community locally um, that wanted to see something that they owned, uh, so within that Highland Postcode area, that they could say, we built that. Um, we own a little bit of Rossshire because the majority of land in Scotland is owned by very few people. Um, gen normal people tend to own their house or rent a house and, you know, not own um, anything um, it, that's large and tangible like a distillery. Yeah. So having <laughs> an equal ownership and an equal vote, um, obviously some have more shares than others, but you get one vote regardless of the shares. So it's democratic in that way. So there's so many parts of it, I think, that engaged. The mm -hmm. environmental, the community ownership, the Scotch malt whiskey community that exists, uh, the expat type person, um, and the the right timing of the crowdfunding as it c as it is um, mm -hmm. exists at this particular time. I think if we were trying to do this um, maybe in the financial crash of two thousand and eight, <laughs> um, I would have said I'm not going to say it wouldn't be a success. It might have been harder um, and not been a such a big success. But yeah, I think timing is important mm -hmm. as well, and the right people involved. I'm very fortunate that the right directors um, got involved and, and, and backed it alongside me. Um, yeah, but very proud of, of everybody. Every single person who's, who's invested should be proud of what, what, we've, what we've created together. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a great, it's a great story and a legacy for everyone. Hmm. But presumably as well as the sort of front man, often times it will be people buying into you and your vision. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, I'm not, um, um, it, it, my idea, um, but all those people had to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I, th I did, at the particular time of trying to raise the money, I think every single person I met w had, you know, was, was literally given Glen Wivis, Glen Wivis, Glen Wivis. That's, what it ha that's the way it has to be mm -hmm. in order to sell the project and for people to, um, to back it. And it just creates this momentum, like you said, the snowball effect of 
and making sure um, that they follow through and they do invest and then the totalizer goes up and then everyone starts to watch and they're going, oh, we need to, we need to invest quickly because this is, um, we want a piece of this before it sells out. Yeah. So yeah, of course, I'm, you know, I'm proud that um, I created the, the project and, and pushed it in that way. But then it's, it's, it created its own momentum and everybody else started to talk about it. Uh, from social media to, mm -hmm. um, you know, in these interesting people I, I uh, you know, I meet, um, hmm. you know, investing and, and backing it and, and getting involved, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I think probably what fascinates me the most is the fact that you don't have specific or relevant experience of doing this, and it's probably uh, akin to the kind of fake it uh, till you make it type idea, but how do you kind of act with certainty and conviction when you must be massively out of your comfort zone? I think that's, I think that's management and, uh, and leadership again, and a board of directors. So, you know, one person, but with an army behind me, <laughs> um, you know, that really is, that's really who we are. We have, I picked, um, vet, directors who were qualified in the, in the area, from the architect to the whiskey expert, to the finance person, to the former head of police for the north of Scotland, community leader, um, to someone in food and drink, um, to a builder. You know, I, I picked wow. those people specifically so that people would look at me, but then they would look just behind me and go, yeah, he's leading it, but he's got the right people there to deliver. And mm -hmm. that's what we've done. So yeah, I mean, I t of course, um, it's, you know, I, um, I don't come from a whiskey making background, but farming is ultimately, um, you know, you, you strip it right back and, you know, it's barley, hmm. it's malted barley, it's yeast, it's water, um, but there's one ingredient which is very important in making Scotch malt and that is finance. Hmm. Um, and, but when it gets to that maturing stage, if you've got it right, there's a good profit in it. And now that profit will go to other um, good causes and that's the, that's the difference there. So we financed it in a different way and the, the future profits go to a, um, you know, into more projects that, that would have this um, social enterprise. Um, yeah, ethos. yeah. So when do you officially um, project bottling, if you like? We will bottle something in three years time. I mean, obviously it's not Scotch malt till it's three years and a day old. Um, mm -hmm. We've just started filling casks now. So it's, it's 2021, um, but the majority of product will, will lie in wait until it's ready. Um, you know, we can't, the, the, the master distiller, we've got a huge experienced um, master distiller, um, Duncan Tate, um, who's spent uh, 21 years for working for one of the corporations and managing six distilleries. Um, mm. So when he says it's ready um, and the market is right, then that's when. Uh, but in the meantime, it's tourism, it's gin, and it's, um, it's, you know, it's different business aspect. Uh, but three years, blink, and it will be. <laughs> we'll, be yeah. we'll be there, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I also read that um, as a community benefit society, the aim is to take a lead role in the rejuvenation of Dingwall and the wider Highlands community. I mean, what is your kind of long-term vision? What does that look like? Well, this, this is tourism. Um, we didn't count on the fantastic North Coast 500 um, coming just at the same time. Um, that came really in a big boom last year. Mm -hmm. um, so Glen Wivis is in on the edge of Dingwall. Tourism did not exist per se in Dingwall, hmm. but now with a distillery and with the huge numbers of tourists that want to visit a distillery mm -hmm. and also go on the North Coast 500, we are the only dual producing whiskey and gin distillery on the North Coast 500. So I'm hopeful that we will get a large slice of, uh, of the tourists from the port at Invergordon, who have obviously um, these fantastic cruise liners coming in, to everyone who's driving around the North Coast 500, uh, or just your average tourist who's um, you know, enjoying the, the scenery. And we've got amazing views and you know, great animals to see and such a fantastic sight. So yeah, it's, um, that's instant. So that's happening now, people are, you know, we're inundated with people wanting to visit um, and that we're, we're, we're obviously holding off until we get past winter uh, and then it will be um, the tourism. So that happens straight away. It's more jobs created, it, it creates spend in the town and further afield. So we're doing our bit um, for our town and that's offsetting, I think, the, the downwards trend of shops closing because people are buying online. Um, everything's becoming centralised. We're here in Edinburgh here, we just have to look uh, just to the north of the bridge and see a huge big store there. Um, 
hmm. you know, uh, obviously jobs are created there and there's lorries and vans, but we're trying to keep rural areas, uh, or our rural area, we're trying to do our bit to, um, to uh, go work on the positives that exist there, which is food and drink and, uh, and, uh, and distilling history. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you're a helicopter pilot, you're a farmer, uh, and you also now are managing a whiskey distillery. I mean, how do you divide and prioritise your time? Well, yeah, this is. Uh, um, I think this is the this is the downfall. Um, <laughs> there's not there's not enough time. Um, there's one important thing, and that's the girlfriend. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's time it's time management. Um, I would say last year was the busiest year ever. Uh, constructing the distillery. Mm -hmm. There's three phases, raising the money, there's building it, and there's going into production. So I think, um, I thought raising the money was difficult, um, as it was. Building it was very difficult. And now we're more into strategy of building the brand and the sales and hitting targets. It's more business as normal now. So hopefully things are a little bit, um, you know, on a bit more of an even keel. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can, you know, we can do work. You're sat at an airport waiting for a flight um, with the modern, Technology, it's um, it's all it's all very manageable. Um, animals, of course, need assistance. Um, I'm very lucky that my family do assist, um, and yeah, people, volunteers. Um, we've got a few volunteers in the distillery uh, that assist. Mm -hmm. um, I think being a good manager and maybe prioritising. I'm a good. I'm very good at prioritising where uh, what has to be done on any given day uh, and when things can be uh, maybe things that are that can wait. Um, yeah. Hmm. Just making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, and I guess that's the military training as well. That of course, um, that does that. So Comes in handy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does a, a sort of typical day for you look like? You a know, typical what, day. What, no typical day. <laughs> really? What There's what no time are you getting up, and what were your sort yeah. of habits throughout the day? Uh, yeah, I'm always an early riser. You mm. know, it's somewhere between six and seven. Um, you know, early riser. Um, I always like to watch the weather. Um, many, many times over through the day because that affects a lot from the energy stuff to the flying to um, what, you know, what my, how my day is going to progress. Um, if, it's, if it's a day that I can't fly, perhaps. Um, if the animals need more attention, if there's snow. So yeah, the weather's a big factor in, um, in, in my day. But most days involve, wherever I am, a short run. Um, it's, I, I, cl I clear my head and it uh, also allows me to eat anything I want. I feel if I, if I do a... 20 or 30 minute run. Mm. Um, I've done a dozen marathons and duathlons. Yeah, and things, saw that. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm 43 <laughs> now, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm happier now doing shorter distance, but it gives me this time to clear my head. Um, so, yeah, typical day, uh, there's a lot of emails um, and delegation. That's, um, you know, that's the, every email is read, every task is attended to, um, prioritised, and, uh, you know, discussed with the individual that might follow through on the task and then we'll, we'll, we'll check in and, uh, and manage it, yeah. And uh, I think that's the, that, that's the underlying um, uh, aspect of how I manage to do flying, farming, distillery, renewable energy is by managing it on a day-to-day -day basis. There yeah. is no typical day. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to have more typical weekends. Um, you know, like I said, um, so that my partner is, uh, you know, always knows what I'm doing, but she's very accommodating, so, uh, yeah. That's good. You uh, need that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need uh, your partner on board. Yeah, very much. <laughs> yeah, but it's good fun. Having fun, Elliot, I think, you know, I wake up with a smile on my face every day, um, always have a laugh. Yeah. It um, doesn't matter what happens. Things go wrong. Um, uh, you know, when you get to your mid-40s, um, you know things go wrong, but you also know things go right and that, just as one, just as one problem clears, another one's coming over the hill. Hmm. Um, but it's just you just deal with it, and uh, you know it. It, uh, it all sorts itself out. <laughs> How do you think you've evolved as a person throughout your life? I think very different to maybe in my twenties um, to in my forties. Now I yeah I worry less definitely, okay. and yeah I think it's I've never really. Um, not cared, but I've never really thought about hugely about what other people are thinking. Um, but I'm, I want to. I certainly want. Always wanted my parents to be proud. I wanted to follow the follow the law that is set. Um, you know, I'm not. A, I'm not. A, you know, a rule breaker in. Uh, you know, in, in that way, and just. Um, you know, just get, live a, a good life. And I, I think sometimes if I'm ever asked, you know, who in, in terms of inspiration, mm -hmm. um, 
any individual. It's not about any any celebrities that I fly. That you know, that's nothing. That's their field. You know, I may have no interest. I, I may have some interest in it. I may not. Yeah. Um, but someone who's living a happy life and is doing what makes them happy. That's the inspiration. Because it changes. You, you, you change from your 20s to your 30s to your 40s. And life, cha- life gives you different cards. Mm-hmm. So how you deal with that um, and you know, what inspires you one year may change, change to the next. You know, like I say, I'm, I'm a very happy person. Uh, I, I like having a laugh. I like getting out into the, into the wild um, and you know, try, not to, try not to get too stressed about life. We're here for a good time, not a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> you know, life just seems to. I can't. It was my forty-third birthday last week, and I really can remember when it was my thirty-fourth. How did that happen? It seems I haven't changed. It's still the same. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think there's a maturity now, um, which bodes well for completing tasks and uh, and people backing you to, you know, on projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Th- this might come across as a slightly contentious uh, question, actually, but I'm just intrigued to get your perspective on it. Um, you know, given the sort of stuff that you do, I suppose. What do you feel is the function of alcohol in society? Well, I think um, again, you know, I live a different life um, in my forties than I did in my in, a, in my twenties, and I think it's o- alcohol has been there for hundreds of years. This is nothing. This is no change. Um, it needs to be managed sensibly. Um, mm-hmm. The cost has to be uh, sensible so that it's not accessible in a very cheap manner. Um, and uh, I think we are at the we're at the craft level, which is more expensive. It's a. It's always been something that I enjoy in really quite small amounts. Mm-hmm. Um, as a pilot, I don't get to drink much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I love a gin and tonic. Um, I love a beer. I love wine, I love whiskey, you know, but I don't get to have it often. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think in, in, in moderation and, you know, sadly, of course, some people, um, you know, go down a different route with that. Mm-hmm. And I think society recognises that. And I think we do a good job these days of, of recognising that and the government at government level, um, you know, having minimum pricing set and very stringent rules on, on alcohol these days. I think it's, it's certainly harder uh, to get hold of than it was in our 20s. I'm sure you remember yeah. um, b- the days before there was um, very strict ID. So I think we've seen huge change mm-hmm. in that. Uh, but everyone, you know, it's up to each individual to, to manage their yeah. um, their expectations. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, you can abuse anything in reality. You yeah, know, you c- anything yeah. done to excess is, is never good. Yes, so. but certainly it is something that, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's it's nice in moderation, um, but yeah. it obviously it can, um, and that's not. It's. I think the thing that really frustrates me is when I see um, socialising weekend to weekend outside and people who are have gone past that limit. So mm-hmm. I would like to see uh, maybe more fines where people know that they can't. You know, they they can't because it's it becomes really. Um, worrying if you're in a in a bar and you're worried because somebody's just you can see that they've had far too much um, yeah. you know that's the thing uh, but I think we're getting better at managing those things with fines that you know obviously um, you know uh, the police t- remove people and uh, yeah. in that way so I think sensible sensible um, hmm. uh, drinking is 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 absolutely fine definitely good answer <laughs> is there anything you would have done differently in your career I don't think so. Um, I, you know, I've really, you know, I've enjoyed everything, the farming. I, I'm enjoying it more now than ever. The mm-hmm. last 10 years has been very busy, building up a, a farm business, building a new uh, business there, um, the distillery, um, relationships, um, mm-hmm. flying reputation. So, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a busy time. There's no substitute for experience, I always say. Mm-hmm. Um, you cannot go into the top um, of any career, you have to start at the bottom and it, you have to work your way up. So, mm. yeah, is, um, does life begin at 40? I think that's probably true. It's, that phrase has been there for a long, long time. So mm. people um, have been med- very knowledgeable, say those things for a reason. Um, I think it's, uh, it takes time to get to, to where you really know what inspires you and where you, know, where you want the rest of your life to go. So, yeah. yeah, I don't think I would change 
Um, I wouldn't change my past, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> uh, there's no skeletons in the closet. <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, I'm just very thankful that I've had a, a very normal life. Um, I've had great support from my parents always and my family. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that I think that's really, uh, that's something I'm hugely thankful for. Um, and, and going forward, it's nice to try to give back, to make, th to make them proud and to make yourself proud um, that you've achieved something and, and a legacy that everyone is part of now with the, the Glen Wivis project. Um, yeah. yeah, it's great to hear and I think what you're doing is incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got a few questions, that maybe more uh, sort of philosophical, slightly deeper questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is starting with your, your sort of purpose, I suppose, in life. I mean, what do you feel has been in looking ahead? I mean, wh what do you feel is your purpose? Well, I think my purpose now is the career of flying helicopters and farming. That, that's, um, it's important because that's job and work pays the bills. Mm -hmm. But the Glen, managing the Glen Wivis project, which is something that I started and that people have backed, that is my priority. That is my purpose right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, when we talked before that I was a volunteer, you know, managing director who's a volunteer. Um, it's not, <laughs> that's not common, um, but yeah. that is, that's because I want it to be a success and I'm determined to see those profits and to see other people benefit from those profits and everyone to feel proud of that. So my purpose is to see it through to the business into profit mm -hmm. and those profits to go via grants into other great projects and to see that legacy for everyone spread into other projects. So that is my purpose, that's my driving force forward just now. Um, you know, I'm sat here really, I feel, to, to talk about the, you know, the, the Glen Wivis project and the unique aspect and for others um, to take inspiration. I think capitalism is changing a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very clear to watch on you know, the media and social media, uh, you know, as to uh, how people live, um, you know, from uh, particularly, you know, wealthy people. So, you know, people are aware of the divide um, and mm -hmm. if, if we can level the playing field that everyone wants to get involved in a big in a business and spread profits in, in that way then it's you know it's a good thing to do and then democratically decide um you know, it's like a small a small government you know we've got <laughs> our own yeah. our own way of um voting and um you know if you're not doing what you say um as a board in that year then we'll you know it'll it'll change so hmm. yeah i just want to i want to see the project to profit and to to see how much good it can do Mm -hmm. And the history of the wh of the history of the whiskey, um, it really it just it's amazing that the old whiskey that was made in the Dingle area, it was huge. It was right the way down to London. So I think this brand really will, um, you know, it will do great things. Uh, and it, to get to into into Europe and into other places in the world, and people to realise that this product um, is doing good for others, that will maybe inspire them to, to think about how, you know, just maybe look at their business model um, yeah. and, you know, uh, hopefully take, some, take uh, uh, something away, if it's not just buying a bottle, take something away from our ethos to, to mm. spread the wealth um, mm -hmm. if, if we can, but in a nice way, um, you know, we're not, mm. um, there's, you know, we've got the left, we've got the right, we've got the middle, um, we're not here to talk about politics, but this is community and this is a product and it's history that exists, and it's just trying to see how we can regenerate the town, and uh, and with this national drink, uh, if we can make that something inspiring for others, um, yeah. tangibly and also in the mindset of others. Hmm. <laughs> what would you like your legacy to be? I think um, I mean legacy is for um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure that um, legacy is something I could really aspire to. I mean, that's for uh, Robert Burns and, uh, you know, <laughs> Napoleon. Um, it, you know, this is a, you know, I'm just a, a chap who was born in Dingwall, um, who's, you know, created a project that wants to see success. So I think maybe we could talk about legacy, um, you know, in years to come. But I think seeing it, this business being a success um, is, 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 is all I want at the moment. Mm. Um, and if we talk about if there's a legacy there, um, then you know that that's all I that's all I want. But I think it'd be a little bit. It's early days to say that um, there's <laughs> that I'm worthy of legacy. Okay.
I think, at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm just living my life. Um, I'm proud of myself, of my achievements to date. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of everyone who's been involved in it. Um, but yeah, we'll see where we'll see where things go in, in years to come. Uh, early days. Okay. Early days. But but maybe in a hundred years time when people are still drinking Glen Wivis and think you know that would be great. That was, that was John but McKenzie. Yes, but that's but is that's <laughs> for that that's to be decided maybe when I'm dead and gone. Sure. I'm just not sure. Okay. I'm not sure that legacy <laughs> is. Uh, I mean, I think you when you're alive, it's your family. Um, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think we'll leave that one. I haven't. I don't think I've earned legacy status quite yet. <laughs> uh, early days yet. Yeah. Um, how do you, you've mentioned success a few times, certainly in the context of, of Glenn Wivis. How do you define success in, in just life terms? Success is happiness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's one person's success may not be someone else's. It's about um, doing what makes you happy. We have such a short time mm -hmm. on this earth to, in, to enjoy life. And we never know. Um, you know, we never know how many days we've got. So success really is about embracing each day um, and enjoying the, the free stuff around you, the environment um, and doing, you know, whether it's your, your children or um, getting out into the great outdoors and, and seeing that. Um, of course, if your career path is going well, that's, that's success. Um, it's certainly not um, monetary um, in, in that way. Um, yeah, there's very few Carnegie's come along. So you know, again, um, we talked before about um, there's always somebody faster, better, mm -hmm. um, just mm. just round the corner. Um, I was watching the you know the tennis last week, and I'm sure Andy Murray's getting worried about uh, the new chap Kyle who's coming in. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. never you're never at the top <laughs> for long. Um, although Roger Federer might, uh, you know, <laughs> he's, he's been at the top for so long. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, not entirely true. But yeah, success is uh, it covers a, a, a you know a huge. Um, a, a wide area, really, mm -hmm. uh, just happiness um, each each day. Mm -hmm. hmm. Excellent. What is it that drives you? I mean, you're clearly a sort of high achiever, high performance individual. Um, although you're probably more humble than would be to, to sort of say that about yourself. Well, I think I would say um, I don't like to. I don't quit, and I don't like failure. Okay. Um, so okay. I think that's that's a driving force. But failure will come, but then it's how you deal with it. Um, and it will come again and again, but it's how you dust yourself off and, and, and react to that. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's not what happens, it's how you deal with it. So, you know, that is, um, yeah, that's probably the short answer there. <laughs> how have you dealt with failure in your life? I think um, grafting. Um, when I bought, I bought my farm, just as the financial recession was hitting. I had just moved to start my own business. Um, ironically, I used to fly Fred Goodwin. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, but I didn't get to fly him then and, t and tell him how difficult it was to get uh, you know, lending back in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think you know, nobody goes through life without failure. And what, you know, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. So yeah, I think um, I always, I go back to when I was at Sandhurst, um, which I mean, I really, I left Dingwall, uh, drove the car. I don't think I'd ever driven south of uh, Edinburgh, Blackpool before. And all the way down to this huge white building, I turned up with an ironing board and really didn't, my feet hardly touched the ground from then. I just did not know what hit me. Um, it was there was so much going on that but it was so, I you know I had to dig in and work so hard there. Mm -hmm. I didn't come from a military background. Um, there was you know th there was um, people from all sort all walks of life, from princes um, to um, Etonians and uh, you know, of people from all countries that I had hardly heard of there. But I knew that I had to stand beside them and and dig in and just work away and that and that's what I do if things are not going right then I just know I've got that grit to to get through it mm -hmm. um, you know I'm tough I'm tough to you know hmm. I'm, I'm tough to get past uh, failure you have to be yeah yeah do you think it should be mandatory to um, be in the services I think service? I do I do like um, I feel that the grounding I was given um, I think w the man I am today um, really part of that if a huge part of that is from the camaraderie and the you know the fun and the travel 
that mm -hmm. I experienced um, when I went and joined the military. So yeah, I think the likes of Norway and uh, you know some of those countries, that type of um, national service, it, it's it's good, healthy start in life. If it's if it's run correctly, so I think yeah, I think it's probably something that I would support. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, the best piece of advice is just to, is to follow your heart, um, mm -hmm. to follow your uh, your heart and your route in life. Um, and yeah, the people that have given me the best advice, I think, always has been my parents. Um, um, my father is a father figure. Um, my mother is so full of fun. Um, and you know, she sometimes just um, doesn't cease to amaze me by sometimes what she'll say, um, to which gives me, um, you know, makes me think, wow, that's a great piece of advice, which is just follow, follow your heart. Um, and when you choose the route for you, the, the world, you know, it conspires to assist you, hmm. you know, if you, if you do that. Um, mm -hmm. It really is about, um, it'd probably be very easy not to, to listen to other people. Um, so many times people tell you, you should do this, you should do that, um, which is great. You know, you listen and go, yeah, thanks. But um, inside, uh, you know, I, I follow my own path. Yeah. Um, probably guilty of telling other people as well. <laughs> 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 but if they ask, if they ask for assistance, then um, that's okay. But uh, yeah. yeah, you live, live your own life. That's the, that's the best way. We're all different. Yeah. And none are the same. If you had the opportunity to speak to your 20-year-old self, what would you say? Um, that you haven't scratched the surface. Um, that in your 20s, I think I mentioned already, there's no substitute, exp no, no substitute to experience. And I always mm. say if I'm training other pilots that you, know, you, it, you have to take time. Don't look at me and try to do what I'm doing or do what another pilot's doing because it takes time to mm. do that. So in your 20s, um, you are hugely inexperienced. There are, you know, people who get lucky that will create a huge, you know, billion-dollar <laughs> business mm -hmm. uh, in their in their twenties, but they're not the norm. Um, generally, it takes a long time, and it's an uphill it's an uphill uh, s a climb to get to success. And there's usually, a, you know, you go down the snakes and ladders. That you go down before you go before you go up. So yeah. I think just take um, take your time and realize that you have not got a lot in your um, up your sleeve at that point <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes a you know it's older wiser um, uh, the, and their their knowledge is hard earned uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I, yeah I was I always respected my elders I was taught that from a very young age um, to go back to when my brother and I were working in the auction mart um, hard-working men who were doing physical work, farmers and yardsmen who worked so hard, um, you know, in their day-to-day -day job, didn't have an off, didn't, they're probably one paycheck away from, uh, you know, paying the rent. And, but we were always, um, you know, taught to respect everybody in that way. And I think having respect, um, and that's the, that's the social aspect of modern living and maybe having, um, having a, national service it's you know good to yeah. you know maybe it's a grounding of um, I go back to the grounding you know it's what you're born into that mm -hmm. molds you so I, I am very thankful to to the guidance I had at a young age of respecting people working hard and you know that that really gives you a good start but not everybody gets that so having some sort of structure and the military does a great job of that mm -hmm. um, so you know to bring to bring people forward and, and offer them travel and um, uh, in that way, adventure mm -hmm. training and yeah. Hmm. If you could change anything in the world, what would it be and why? Um, I think access to travel. It's improved greatly. Um, the the low cost airlines. You know, if you, if you remember, thirty years ago, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, people couldn't afford to fly. It was more for the for the wealthy. So. I think that moulds experiences and career choices. So, in some way, I, I feel that my travel experiences and what what I've seen and where I've been, from war zones to, um, you know, travelling extensively in Scotland and Europe, and you know, it's a big world out there, mm -hmm. and some people are deprived access to that. So, how can we allow everybody to access 
that. Because you know when they're stuck in their own small town and they can't they can't break out. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Some um, I'm not going to uh, not going to go for world domination yet, but <laughs> some um, Scottish or um, UK wide accessible um, travel grant that allows mm. youth to go and experience things at that age. So maybe from age 16 to 21, everybody gets, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, 150 pounds and gets to go to, um, to travel because that bag and what they see maybe could set them up for life. That's, that's the first time I've heard that, interestingly, yeah. which- It's a travel industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. How has, um, you know, your own travel impacted your worldview, for example? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I mean, I've been to Bosnia, I've, I've served over there, Northern Ireland, Germany, America, Canada, uh, you know, all over Europe. Um, you know, I'm, I think I've seen a lot and I, I know that there's a lot out there. Um, but I also feel that I know my own country um, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I remember flying uh, uh, Alex Salmond, who's such a great personality and very personable. Um, and he said to me, um, he said, you know, Johnny, I think, I think you might know this country as well as I do. <laughs> um, because just because we got talking about <laughs> all the places he's been and um, you know, the, the, all these, uh, the, the top of Shetland to, to the borders, to all the islands, you know, I've, I'm, very lucky at all the pl things I've seen in Scotland. It's yeah. great, it's great. I mean, it really is, um, there's so much to see in our own country. And I think a lot of people are maybe too keen to jump on a cheap flight and go abroad. Hmm. Whereas you can learn just, you know, a lot in your own country, our history. You know, Sir Walter Scott, Burns, it's just so much hmm. um, on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, from here in Edinburgh to, um, to the islands, you know, I, I love I love Scotland really very very dearly. Hmm. Excellent, excellent, John. It's been brilliant speaking to you. I've I've honestly enjoyed this immensely. <laughs> um, I think that the work that you're doing uh, is absolutely phenomenal, and I wish you every success in the future. Uh, genuinely, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Is there anything that um, we haven't covered that you wanted to cover? Or no, I think we've I think we've covered uh, you know lots and lots. It's been a really yeah. uh, it's been a great morning. Yeah, enjoyed good it. stuff. I hope, hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic, John. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.